Lives, Father, and those who might not, or those who are listening to it on YouTube or so, or any type of social media platform, Father, let them be blessed in, in every single way possible, Father, because you are the one who blesses, you are the one who picks and chooses, Father. Lord, we choose to come to you, we choose to find you, but even though we need to find you, you first have to find us, Father, because even though we loved you, you still loved us first, Father. So, Lord, I pray again that we bless, that we be blessed by the sermon that Pastor Dark is about to give us, Father. And, Lord, may, be, may us be blessed in every single day of our lives, Father. In the name of Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's give a praise clap to the Lord for using this wonderful young man for the Lord. And we should be encouraging our young people when they're used by the Lord. Because, you know, there's a plenty of young people out there who are um, not serving the Lord. And when we have someone such as his age serving the Lord and worshiping and praising the Lord, we should encourage them. Amen. And be thankful. Because, you know what, there's a lot of kids his age who are doing things, you know, we would like be different. And he is a beacon of light, not just here in Co-op City, but in his own neighborhood, in his school. And we need more youth in that matter who love the Lord. So we should encourage him. We should encourage him whenever he's worshiping. We should encourage him when the day he comes and brings the word here, which will be soon enough. And we should be training our youth, training our youth to be the future preachers, evangelists, missionaries. That's the kind of people that we want to continue walking in the Lord. Because you know what? Sometimes we get stale, let's be honest. We get cold. So somebody has to encourage us. And the youth have that heart, they have that energy. And when they're in love with the Lord, they get on fire in the Lord. And that fires us up. For those of us who've been in the Lord for some time, we're like, after a while, we're like, get a certain age where we're like, you know, I'm too old to do this. I'm too, old. you know, that's nonsense. Because you're never to do the will of God. There is no age limit to the will of God. You can still serve the Lord in many capacities. Age is just a number. And we're not talking about Aliyah. <laughs> so we're going to go into the preaching today. And the sermon today is called Walking in Our Newness, which is a series we started for this month of January. We started our New Year's. And we're talking about the space between us. If you look around you, there is space between all of you. And really, there should be less space between all of us, meaning that this church should start getting filled. And it starts with you communicating the gospel to your neighbor, to those around you. We have to limit the space between us and our neighbors. We have to communicate how loving God is. And it starts where you live at. And then it continues extending outward. We spoke last week in the sermon how sin could be like a bomb. It radiates outward. And that shrapnel starts affecting those further down the line. So let's say, for example, I mentioned if I was to be a sinful act outside of my marriage, then that's not only going to affect my wife. It's going to affect our family members. Because families choose sides. Let's be real. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to be like, oh, Darby would never do that. Oh, Minnie would never do that. <laughs> so all you have is a civil war going on, and that shot will continue radiating outward. Mm -hmm. And then, as a minister of the word of God, some of you may end up choosing sides as well. And then that shrapnel starts affecting the church as well. But you know what we want? We want positivity. We want the gospel to affect those around us. We want it to be a blessing that radiates across the community and then across the world. And it starts with us. It starts with us. It starts simple as this young man right here, taking that gospel, living the gospel in his community, which means in his school, where he lives at, and then here in community with us together. So we have to remember how to walk in our newness and limit the space between us. And that's what Paul starts mentioning in the book of Ephesians. So we're going to go in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And his focus when he writes this letter is in unity. Remember, a lot of people preach out of the book of Ephesians to show how a healthy church should look like. Okay? We need a healthy church because there's a lot of unhealthy churches out there. There's a lot of people who are walking hurt because they've been in an unhealthy church. Healthy church starts with healthy leaders, meaning it starts with whoever the under shepherd is, which myself in this instance, in this location, this local church. And if I'm not teaching my leaders properly, then they're not gonna be able to be a function in the body in this local church. So it starts with me first, then them, and then you. 
because you're also responsible to make sure you're walking correctly in the Lord, okay? And we have to understand that we have to have patience. One of the things, especially as New Yorkers, we have very little patience. <laughs> We've seen that in the pandemic. You know, nobody wanted to be next to each other on MTA or none of that. We got very little patience. Not understanding that we may have our issues, but so does that person next to you. That person may be suffering. And we're thinking, I'm suffering. I know before I served the Lord, I said, if I'm suffering, everybody's suffering. Mm -hmm. I'm miserable, everybody's miserable. Ain't nobody happy around me. I really don't know how some people maintain friendships with me. Because I'm like, if I'm miserable, I'm making your life miserable. Know that now. And these people still remain friendships with me. And in the Lord, they realize they're still friends with me, but they realize the difference between before Christ and after Christ. And they are thankful that I serve the Lord. And the majority of them serve the Lord now because they would witness that change in me. It wasn't me preaching to them. It was the witness of the change. You don't have to hit people over the head with the Bible. Live the change in your life. Remember, the other thing we spoke about last Sunday is immersion. When you get baptized in the waters, what's in effect happening is you're being immersed. You're covered with the water. You're burying your old self so when you part that water and you come right back up, you're saying, I'm going to behave like the old me. I'm behaving like a new me. The old me, everything is gone. It's the past. So we can't be walking around as Christians with a rare view mirror that we're always looking at, oh, the misery I suffered in the past, that's why I'm the way I am. No, no, you're a new creature. The past is the past, it's over, it's buried. Walk in your newness. Remember, you're a new creature, now you're making new life. I'm gonna nerd myself up here. <laughs> There's a TV show called Loki, which speaks about multiple timelines, right? And how people would love to have changed their life in a different timeline. So you have one person who, he lost his family in a car accident. So he's looking for that same family in a different timeline. And he's trying to relive that life. But that was the old life. That's not your life any longer. Mm -hmm. So as he's trying to find that timeline, he's realizing he's seeing someone else's life. Because now, yes, that might be you in another timeline with your child and your, your, your wife. But that's not your life. That's their life. And you're stealing it from them. We need to stop looking at the past. We can't correct the past. Move forward. Look at what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord told them, do not look back. Whoever looks back will stay behind. As believers, we have to have a kingdom vision. We have to keep our eyes on Christ. Don't look to your left. Don't look to your right. We have to be like horses with horse blinders. Yes, there are injuries in the past. I'm going to be honest with you. Me and my mom did not get along in the beginning because of injuries in the past. Only in the Lord can we get along. And sometimes my mom will try to drag me back there before I was immersed in the waters. And she knows it. Because when she sees that person that kind of peeks out, she goes, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring that person out. We have to leave the past in the past. Don't bring up the past, let it go. And if you have an issue with a person, pray for them. That's what we need to do. We have the tools that the Lord gave us to move forward, to be in unity, to deal with people with patience and love, okay? So one thing we always have to remember is that there's always potential for this unity. I've always mentioned to you guys, the church is a hospital. Perfect example of what we see going on this season right now. If you're not sick and you end up in a hospital, you know you're going to come out sick, right? Most likely you will. So for example, if my wife gets injured and I take her to the ER and I go to the ER with her and I'm perfectly fine, somebody has a cold or whatever, most likely I'm going to come out with a cold. I'm waiting there healthy. I'm going to come out sick. This is what we have to keep in mind. When you come into a church, the church is filled with imperfect people being made perfect in Christ. But some of these people still are being going through the process of healing. So you have to keep that in mind. Be merciful, not just to them, but also to yourself. We're all going through the process of healing, of growth. We're not perfect until we get into heaven. So how are you going to judge a church based on the fact of all oh, oh, these people are hypocrites. First off, you just opened your mouth, so you're the first hypocrite. You went in there criticizing before deciding to be part of that community and getting to know that community. There is no perfect church. When we look for a church, we should be looking for a church in which best we can serve in, 
not what we can get out of it. If you find a church that you feel love, then praise the Lord. That's what you feed, should feel, the love of the community, a great warmth greeting. People who are concerned, did this person show up? They didn't show up, what happened? Let's see if they're okay. That should be the church you look for. Are they gonna always be perfect? They're, no, they're not. We're human, we're gonna make mistakes on this earth. And that's what Paul's trying to communicate here. So he's gonna give us the tools on how to be patient. Because let's be honest, that's a muscle we have to practice. It's like going to the gym. You don't lose weight until you learn how to change your diet. These are new things we have to learn. So if you notice, we talked about the new year um, um, last month. Most people make resolutions that they want to change their body type and they want to go to the gym and so on. And we become so socially healthfully conscious. We'll say, oh, I'm going to stop eating salt. Oh, I'm going to stop eating fish because there's too much plastic in the fish. And we, we come up with all kinds of things. Now understanding that whatever we eat, we should be praying to the Lord and being thankful. And the Lord will bless that food and make it well for you. We just have to learn how to do portion control because sometimes we eat like nobody's going to feed us the next day. We got to learn how to eat. Better. That's what it comes down to. It's learning eating habits. Same way with the Word. We're supposed to be immersed in God's word, meaning that we should be reading God's word on a constant basis. For those of you, I wonder how many of you, both online and those physically here, are reading the Bible with us. We're so far constantly been reading the Bible. We had our last session on Zoom last Wednesday, and we went over what we learned. Because a good church will teach you to read the Bible, but also take notes. Is there any questions you have? What did the word speak to you? Because the word is living. It's always speaking. So we should be attuned to what God is trying to tell you. I know I'm definitely hearing the word. And the best way to do it is, if you read the word prior, like if you read the whole Bible prior, read it in a new translation. You'll be surprised what new openings occur with a new translation. Right now, I'm reading it in the New Living Translation. I've never read the Bible in a year in a New Living Translation. I've read it in the NIV. Um, I think I read it in the King James, which I would never recommend, sorry. But... I, I, I would recommend New Living Translation. It does bring new life to it. And take notes. And that's what I recommend. So we see in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul describes another body, the body of Christ. We should be more interested in the body of Christ's health, the health of the church. We should listen closely to Paul, for we are part of this body as Christians. Not this local body only, but the universal body. So for example, in this local body, we are just a finger in the universal body of Christ, okay? So we should pay attention because unlike a lot of changing health opinions, this is the eternal truth. The word is the word of God. I'm not sure about the benefit of, let's say, for example, parsley water. There's some people that have home remedies. They say, okay, uh, are you drinking honey with tea to make your throat better and so on? And everybody has different ways. Like some people have mushroom coffee. They say it's an anti-inflammatory. So I had someone recommend that to me, mushroom coffee, as an anti-inflammatory. And for some people, it does work. Does it taste well? Don't ask me. <laughs> but it does work. You try, you've had it? I had it when I went to Vegas. Oh, all right. So see, it's out there, and it does work for some people as an anti-inflammatory. And the thing we have to keep in mind, everybody's body type is different. So... A healthy church is marked by spiritual unity. So we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and I'm going to read it in the New International Version. <laughs> and let me know when you guys are all there with an amen. 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 All right. So we're going to read it in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it starts with verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and one Father of all. One who is over all and through all and in all. So we see here Paul is encouraging people and confirming to people the Gentiles, the non-Jews, 
have been reconciled to the Lord. They've been restored into proper relationship with the Lord. Remember, when we read the word of God, we got to read it in the context to who it was written to. It was written to those people at that time. It is a benefit for us, but we have to read it in the context who it was written to. And it was written to those people because at that time you had non-Jews, Gentiles, starting to come to the Lord, bless you, CJ, and walking with the Jewish Christians. But they had issues because the Jewish Christians still were following the Old Testament. And there were some legalistic rules that were there at that time. And Jesus Christ has said, he simplified it. Simple as this. Love me and love your neighbor. Very simple. Two simple rules. Love the Lord, love your neighbor. And people were adding. We can't add to the Lord. We can't add to the gospel. It's not gospel plus. We see that happening a lot today in churches today. For example, you see ministries rising up, deliverance ministries. Jesus did not focus on deliverance ministry. Otherwise, that would have been his main concern. His main concern was what? Make disciples help people come to the Lord and grow in spiritual maturity. He didn't say anything important in terms of deliverance. Do we have the ability to cast out demons? Yes, in the name of Jesus. Jesus. We can. Yes, we can. Is that the main focus? No, it is not. The main focus is to disciple. Every church should be learning to disciple people, helping people come to spiritual maturity and sending them out. A lot of churches, what ends up happening nowadays is they want to take ownership of people. That's why I don't like that word membership. When you become a member of something, there's an ownership there. Like when you become a member of a gym, let's say export over here in Co-op City, you're signing a paper saying, um, you have a right to sue me if I don't pay for my membership fees. That means you own me. I own something, I owe you. We're not members here. We're in community together. We have a responsibility to grow together. But I don't own you. See, because if I owned you, I'd be saying, you can't leave this church. You can't go to another church. You can't visit another church. That's too many can'ts. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, there's a lot of churches doing that. No, if you want to visit another church, I have no problem. Make sure it's a gospel teaching church. Mm -hmm. And if you're in community with us, whatever you learn over there, bring it here. Yeah. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. We have to bless each other. I visited many churches when I worked in the world and I traveled in the world. I made it my business to visit other churches. So I first get to know my fellow brothers and sisters in the faith. Because mm -hmm. that they're family. We're adopted into the family in Christ. So I don't know how many of you ever found a lost family member. You want to get to know them better, right? So my cousin is very well known for that. As she continues getting, because we're a small family, she continues finding more cousins out there. She goes and travels and gets to spend time with them. She's better than I, because I'm like, okay, nice to know you, because we're cousins. Okay. You know what? I'm, I'm very have issues, trust issues. I do. I admit it. I have trust issues. So my thing is, I don't want to find family members because I'm afraid they're gonna be like, so now we're family. Can you let me? No. <laughs> I, I, I have plenty of people that try to borrow from me. I don't need any new family members to try to borrow from me. My cousin has a better heart in that aspect than me. She'll go find those people and so on. Me, I'll be like, good to know you. We'll be Facebook cousins. I know you're on Facebook. How you doing? And that's it. <laughs> but we have to be more loving. In the adoptive family of Christ, we got to get to know each other and realize that that person can bless you. That person's gifts can bless you and you can learn from them. That's why we are in the body of Christ. We get to know each other and know each other's gifts because my gifts are not going to be the same gifts as CJ's. As you can hear his voice, his voice is better than mine. Even right about now, his voice sounds better than me speaking right about now. But he has an angelic worship voice. I would love to be able to sing like him, you know? And he has a gift that the Lord speaks to him and uses him and preps his heart for evangelizing. That's what gonna, his calling is going to be, evangelizing to others. And that's great. Don't be afraid of it, CJ. Do not be afraid of it. We fulfill what God called us to do. We were put on this earth for a purpose, okay? But in order for that to happen, we have to grow. So we see Paul here communicating. He says, the non-Jews have been reconciled to God and brought into his people proper restoration. The discussion provides a starting point for chapters 4 through 6, where Paul explains how believers should live in unity, peace, accomplished through Christ. Paul begins 
in emphasizing the oneness of God's people. We are one in God's people. We come from different nationalities. Some of us speak different languages, but we are one in Christ. We are one in family. There is no such thing as a nation under just one nation under God. Because sometimes we, we tend to um, be culturally divided. Oh, I'm Puerto Rican. Oh, I'm Dominican. I'm Caribbean. I'm Jamaican. And we start dividing. No. We're all one in Christ. Yes, I'm Puerto Rican. But I'm Christian. That's my identity. We have to recognize our identity in Christ. I am a new creature in Christ. That's my identity. And that should be foremost. Do you see me at the Puerto Rican parade? No. I'll tell you right now, you don't see me at the Puerto Rican parade. <laughs> Done that. But am I a proud Boricua? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I'm a proud Boricua. There was the other day I saw a, a cartoon, and one of the main characters was Puerto Rican, right? And the artist is an animation artist, and my cousin is in animation and special effects in, in, in the film industry. And we started laughing because in a microscopic picture, you have this Puerto Rican character being spoken by his Puerto Rican mom, right? And we all know if you have a Puerto Rican mom, when you're in trouble, you know when you're in trouble. You hear the tone, and when the character was speaking to the son, all you saw was little miniature Puerto Rican flags flying. You know what you mean I'm talking about, right? And I saw that, and I just started cracking up, and it just brought me flashbacks to my mom just speaking to me. And I was like, yeah, that's the vibe we feel. It's like the, the Latino, like, reprimand that makes you feel worse than, than getting hit with the belt, you know? <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm, in, I'm hearing it now, I'm hearing it now. And I sent it to everyone and they started laughing. And they was like, wow, those little marks that you would never have seen, it looks like just a squiggly mark, but when you zoom in, it's a Puerto Rican fly. We can be proud of that, that's okay. But that shouldn't be our identity. Our identity is new creatures in Christ. So, as a Christian man, even without words, impress both his team. We're going to speak about famous football coach from Dallas, Tom Laundrie. When he passed away, he had many people, including his players, who spoke at his funeral. And one of the things that many of his players mentioned is the fact of how godly he was. And that speaks volumes. When after you go with the Lord, that someone can say, this was truly a godly man. We, I'm sure we know people that we can testify who went with the Lord, they're godly people. You know, um, I've had <laughs> people in our past, we've had like my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, I've commended my mother-in-law. You guys never met my mother-in-law? Uh -huh. Well, Eric has, Eric has. Um, she developed Alzheimer's later in life, but one thing is she never forgot the Lord. She will worship the Lord. She may sometimes forget family members, like she couldn't remember my mom's face, but she remembered my mom's name. So if my mom spoke behind a door, she'll know that's her. But if she saw her person, she'd be like, who's this chick? You know? But if she heard her voice, she'd be like, that's your mom. So in the same aspect, she knew the voice of the Lord. And one thing I loved about my mother-in-law is that, because I stay up late, I can't go to sleep early. I go to sleep like at one, two in the morning, right? And sometimes she would stay up with me watching TV, right? But if she falls asleep, I would hear, I would tease her, because she would tease me too. Sometimes I would hear her snoring, and I'd be like, you know, you were snoring. She goes, no, I wasn't. But then at that time that she wasn't snoring, she will be praising the Lord. So the word she would be saying is, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I'm like, wow, she's having her own service. And right now, she is having her own service. And that's what we should be looking forward to. That's where we should be praising the Lord. And here's the thing to keep in mind. She always praised the Lord before the all-timers. That's developing muscle memory, spiritual muscle memory, so that when that memory was disappearing, the spiritual muscle memory was still there. The spirit still was praising the Lord. That's what we should be craving. That at any moment, if we forget, in our spirit, it still comes out. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord for getting me this far. Because sometimes we question when we see family members go through that. And we wonder, we ask God, why did this have to happen? You know what? It happened because we live in a fallen earth. Sin introduced into the world. Because if sin was not introduced to the world, we wouldn't have to worry about health, illnesses, and so on. We would have been in the garden still. We would have been literally walking with God. And we would have been living in submission to God. 
Now we have to practice that spiritual memory of living with God. And that starts being immersed, being in God's word. So this is what Paul is encouraging people. If people are going to speak about you, let them speak godly things. And only can happen if you're living in your newness, if you're walking in your newness. We hear a lot, of, a lot about people who believe in one thing or do another, who talk the talk but don't walk the walk. So when a man with a large public image, such as Tom Laundrie, Dallas coach, backs up his confession of faith with constantly Christian way of life, it generates enormous respect. Sadly, however, many Christians never seem to put the two together. They move from talk to the walk, from faith to life, from calling to commitment. What that means is that at a certain point, we start going to church only because we're committed to going to church, but we're not committed to the Lord. We're just saying, I have responsibilities at church, so I have to go to church. So for example, if you hold a position, let's say for example, you are in charge of the technology for the church. You're only going because you're doing that. And I've met people who do that, which is not good. If you're just coming to church because you have a job, you need to sit down. You need to sit down, we'll figure it out. I'm the mindset, we'll go without tech. You can't do it, that's all right. Sit down and eat, hear the word, but don't come to church because you got a job to do. No, that's not why we come to church. We come to church to recognize the glory of God, to praise him, and due to that praise we serve because we know we are blessed by him. So we don't come to serve expecting something in return because sometimes we do things because we like the attention or we like, for example, the rewards, because in some churches, they actually have salaried employees, which I'm not really fond of, you know? Because then you're just coming because you're an employee. Mm -hmm. That's all that's bringing you. That should not be the case. What brings you should be is that you want to serve in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. okay? So we see for three chapters, Paul has been emphasizing the call. <coughs> we have been called by God the Father who decreed his plan of salvation and eternity past. We have been called by Jesus Christ, who implemented the plan through his incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. We have been called by the Holy Spirit, who regenerated us, sealed us, and empowered us to do his will, not us to put into action. I've mentioned in times before, the book of James, our faith should be producing action. If we're not moving and growing in the Lord, there's a problem. We should be looking in a spiritual mirror. How far am I growing? You remember, for those who have children, when your children were growing up, maybe you did it, that you would have them stand next to the door frame and you would measure how tall they're going and so on, you know? And the kids would get excited. And then, if you ever move from that house, they don't want to move because they're remembering their growth. They're seeing how they grew in that location. They don't want to leave that cherished memory because they saw their potential. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing our potential? Are we seeing our growth spiritually? Because some of us are stagnant. I'm going to be real with you. I don't handhold. Some of us are stagnant. Some of us should be growing more than we're, where we at. Mm -hmm. Some of us may be six-year-olds in the Lord when we should be 30-year-olds in the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, We need to be focused more in the kingdom of God. We're letting past hurt hinder us. We're letting other things, we have thin skin compared to the thick skin we had before we served the Lord. Because you know, before we served the Lord, anything people told us, we didn't get offended so easily. In the Lord, we get offended way too easily. It's for example, without putting no names, someone had said something and he knew that it was in the wrong way, so he asked forgiveness of me, right? And I told him, I forgave you already. I said, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm not even worried about it. It's not even in the front of my mind. And he said, yeah, because, you know, some people brought it up to me and some people were upset about it. I said, that I knew. I knew as soon as he said what he said, that those that were witnesses were going to be more upset than I was. Because it depends on your spiritual maturity. And that's the thing about the body of Christ. You have to be careful. We should be thinking like doctors. Do no harm. Because if I say something, for example, if I say something negative towards CJ, it's not only going to affect CJ, it's going to affect everybody who's been a witness and including his mom. His mom might say, you know what, I don't want to serve the Lord anymore. Look how he treated my son. Mm -hmm. 
So this is what we have to be careful with. We should be careful of not doing any harm. Our words can do a lot. As the book of James says, the tongue, a small muscle, it's like a small flame that can take out a whole wilderness. We need to be very careful with our words. That's why I, my past sisters and definitely Mary's were very well aware. And she caught on real quick because sister is very observant of me. I tend to be slow to speak to the point that I bite my lip a lot. And you may catch on as you get to know me. So before I say anything, I think very long and hard and ask, Lord, speak for me because I don't want to say anything out of turn. So I bite my lip a lot. I hold on. I said, you know what? I've been on the other end. I'd rather just make sure I don't say anything wrong. And if I have an issue with someone, I make sure we talk in private, alone, and make sure we clear the air. Okay? So that's something we should be doing. And I'm glad that person came to me afterwards and cleared the air. I appreciate that. But I sure wasn't putting no mind to it. I'm like, you know what? That's the way the enemy works. He wants to trip people up in the church because they have been through in the service. He wants to trip people up. Did it bother me? Just for a second, just a tiny second, I was like, and then I said, I ain't gonna worry about that. I gotta let it go. Because you know what? It's not gonna get me into heaven. Now, me getting angry will keep me out of heaven. Because then I may do things that I'm not supposed to be doing. And that's the key in walking to our newness. So we see we are united by Christ-like conduct. If we look at verses 2 and 3, verses 2 and 3 says, Be completely humble and gentile. Be patient. Bury with one another in love. Make every effort. Notice that key. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Notice the tail end, the bond of peace. We're gonna analyze those two verses. So he begins in verse two by laying down five stepping stones for a worthy walk, which we can summarize with five words. Where do these stepping stones lead? I don't know when you was a kid, if you ever crossed a river and you watch a step on the stones, you know how stones can be slippery sometimes? So you watch a step. Um, if you don't watch a step, you might end up for a crazy fall. I remember going fishing with my stepdad years ago in Pan Bay Park. And for those who don't know, Pan Bay Park, that actually used to be a dump site. I know I'm aging myself now. Yes, that used to be a dump site. It used to be a garbage dump, and then they turned it into a park, and it's a huge mound. And my stepdad used to take me into that mound as they were transforming it to go fish because it was high, and we would fish cast off it. So they put some rocks there and so on and made it a man-made formation. But if you were not careful, you could fall down the rocks. So my stepdad was always conscious to tell me, be mindful where you step. And me being a kid, and my wife will testify, I was always running around, not looking where I was going, hop, skip, whatever, running. But I just never looked where I was at. That's why I was always on the floor. My mom always said it. So I'm doing the same thing with my fishing rod. I'm going around, just being my jolly self and I missed the rock. And we were high up and I went right over and right into the ocean. And at that time I fell, there was a shark there. Because somebody took a pit bull, cut it up, and threw it in the ocean so it was bloody and there was a shark there. And he, without thinking, immediately jumped in. Now to his surprise, because I have a definitely fear of sharks, even to this day, all I saw was a shark, and I literally jumped out that water. That when he jumped in, I was already out on the rocks. That he said, where did you go? I said, I saw the shark, and I came out. <laughs> and he was like, I jumped in with my wallet and everything. I said, I just saw the shark, and I came out. That was it. But we have to watch our step. So here we see Paul saying, we have to watch our step, and we have to look at the stones. And the first stone is humility. And if we look at the Greek word for humility, it is tapos no sorene, which means lowliness of mind, meaning that you put yourself lower than the person next to you. And one thing I said in preaching uh, um, sermons prior is to think of other people beside you higher than yourself. Because most times we break people down. We look at a person and be like, I dress better than they do. Um, I know more than they do. How about looking at a person and being like, wow, maybe I could learn something from this person. 
you know? That's the way we should be looking at people. Maybe there's something valuable in that person that I could pick up and it'll be valuable for me and I can learn from. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I loved from Pastor Sam as a mentor. He never acted like he knew more than everybody else. He always was a humble person who would look and said, okay, what can I learn from you? When I first came to CCC, one of the things I was doing was I had a radio program, podcast, which I still have to this day. And when he learned I was doing it, he says, I want you to show me everything you know. Everything you know. He's, he wanted to absorb it. He says, just show me everything. From the very beginning, he sat down with me and he never acted like a big person or anything. And I showed him little by little. And then we started doing things together. We even did a podcast, several together. And that's the way we should be looking at other people. What can I learn from that person? That's how we should be humble. We need to be gentle. We need to be mindful that we're not perfect. We have to be careful how we speak to other people. If we look at John, if you go with me, John chapter 3, verses 29 and 30. And the key verse is going to be 30. John chapter 3, verses 29 and 30. And I'm reading it in the New International Version. And it reads as follows. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him. And is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. That key verse is for us, dirty. He must become greater, we must become less. That also includes not Jesus. Jesus must become greater in us. The way Paul always said it, less of me, more of him. But it's also the fact that we have to become less when we deal with the other, when we deal with other people around us. Remember, as I also mentioned in sermons past, the joy in the Lord, meaning Jesus first, always for the other, being intentional with others around us, and last for ourselves. We put ourselves last. If we continue that tool of walking in joy, we'll find greater joy in the Lord. And we treat others with love. Starting at home first. So for example, if my wife has an issue with me, I have to bring it to the Lord first. Review to me, am I doing something wrong? Then, I have to remember, she's not just my wife, she's my sister in Christ first. So as I treat her as the other, I have to be intentional in treating her as my sister in Christ first, not my wife. Am I always perfect in that? No, I'm not, I'm gonna be real, but that's my goal. And then, put myself last. That even if she hurts my feelings, I don't take it to heart. I present it to the Lord. Because the Lord's the one who's going to reveal to her if she hurt my feelings. Because let's be real. <laughs> as human people, we could be, someone could hurt us. It doesn't matter if you bring it to the person. Because not every person is going to be receptive. Some person may be selfish and be like, I don't care. So I hurt you? Good. Mm. So then what, what was settled there? Nothing. That's why we presented to the Lord first. Then the Lord will give you the discernment when to speak to that person because then the Lord is already dealing with that person because you prayed it, you gave it to the Lord. And then if that does not go well, meaning that's dumb being disobedient to God because God always deals with everyone, then you let it go. You made the effort. It didn't work out. See you, bye. That's okay. We can agree to disagree. Still love you. May God bless you. And that's it. You keep it moving. But there are some people that carry that hurt with them like a book bag full of bricks. And they're like, I refuse to put this book bag down. I hurt too much. Some people actually love the hurt. I'm going to be real with you. Before I served the Lord, I used to live in the hurt. Now, when someone hurt me, I just lived in it. Like if it was powdered glass and I was chewing on it. And then what I wanted to do was share that hurt with others, meaning I hurt other people. That's not a good way to live. There's a lot of people in New York and in the world that are walking in that manner. We need more Jesus in the world. And we need to be living more joy. More Jesus, less of us, more intentionality with the other. 
So we see in gentleness, we see Christ's own self-description. Humility and gentleness go hand in hand. Humility is an attitude of mind. Gentleness refers to the outward manifestation of a person's humble demeanor. So if a person is gentle, it's because they already live in their humbleness. So it's already being projected out. When someone sees you're a nice person, remember I told you how sometimes people fall in love with the anointing, that they get attracted to you, whether it be a male or female, they may say, I love being around this person. Don't think it's your cologne. It is not your cologne. <laughs> it is the spirit, the anointing of the Lord that they love. They're attracted to the Lord. It has nothing to do with that Polo Ralph Lauren. It has to do with the Lord. And that's why I always goof with people. I say, don't smell yourself now. Because you might smell totally different from the anointing. You might be like, man, I must be smelling good. Then you're like, it might not be that. I, I need to be smelling like the anointing. Meaning, I need to be living in my newness. So, we have to understand, like humility, gentleness is a vital step toward unity. Because it softens our sharp edges. How many of us have sharp edges? I don't know how many of you ever, when you had kids, they played with Lego. And you ever step on a Lego? You know how sharp those things are, right? They're like a deadly weapon to society. I remember in ministry, I had a young man who loved Legos, and he used to touch, torture his family. They were all over the house. And his father used to tell me, you don't know how many times we've fallen on these things. They're like horrendous. They're like booby traps. And he never outgrew it. To this day, I think he's 18 now, right, honey? Jay? He's 18. Um, and I think he still loves Legos. You know? And you have adults that love Legos. But we can be like a Lego. We could be very sharp. And if we're not careful with that sharpness, we can end up cutting those around us. So we have to, the way we dull that sharpness is in our humbleness and our gentleness. It starts rounding those edges off. Um, it keeps us from scraping, cutting, and bruising those who get close to us. Before the Lord, you couldn't get next to me. I was like a rose bush. Thorns. Don't try to love me. I don't want to be loved. In Christ, I know I'm loved by the Lord. And that's all I need. Mean. But I also recognize I couldn't be loved by others unless I'm loved by the Lord first. So it softens us up. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. It is the way we are to care for one another. And we have the next stone, patience. The third stepping stone of the worthy walk is patience. Three virtues we've considered so far. The step of patience is the most difficult because it comes in the hardest way. How do you think you develop patience? It's through trials. That's why it's the hardest. If, if, as the sister mentioned, if you want to develop patience, have kids. <laughs> it, 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 that, that can be trying. I, I've counseled many parents who've had children that sometimes stepped wayward. And I, I, I've counseled many parents that'll be like, look, um, if you don't take this kid away from me, I might murder him. You know? And, uh, and <laughs> there are kids that would love to push buttons. Um, when I'm mentioning names, I just had a talk with one of the, um, my pastor friends, and I was saying how, in a, in a way, I miss it, but there was a, a pastor and his son, and the son knew what bites to push on his dad, but he did it playfully, right? But sometimes he would do it at the wrong times, right? So it's hard being a pastor's kid, right? Because, you know, there's so much pressure on a pastor's children. And for some reason, that's another area that the Lord puts me to counsel pastors' children. And I remember um, speaking to them, and I would see him how he sometimes would tease his dad intentionally. And he would do it on the day he's going to preach. And I'm like, dude, don't you know your dad's going to preach? Leave him alone. Mm -hmm. And he would laugh. And I'm like, you're doing it on purpose. Leave him alone. And the dad would go, Darby, he's doing it on purpose. I said, I know, I know. He goes, talk to him. Talk to him, because you know if I talk to him, I'm like, I'll talk to him. <laughs> and it, but I, I, I'm, in memory, I enjoy it. At that time, I was like, yo, why are you doing this to him? But it was their way of like getting through the day, you know? It's those things that, you know, in the moment, you didn't realize you were cherishing that time you had. Was it wrong? Yes, it was wrong. He should have not been teasing him, especially when you go up and preach. But 
you know, you cherish those memories of that time that it was in jest, okay? So it helped build patience. Because let's be honest, patience doesn't come easily. It comes through trials, it comes through difficulties, okay? So when you're stuck in traffic, do you have patience or not? Ooh. You know in New York, a lot of people don't have patience. Oh man, I can see people, I was driving New Year's Eve to New Year's Day. I can't stand those, those times because, you know, there's a lot of alcoholics drinking out there, driving, and we were coming home three in the morning. I dropped my mom off, and I'm on the highway, and all I see is cars just zooming in and out, in and out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, these people are not thinking of the other. That you can take away this life. Not only that, you know how many people die on New Year's Eve? Mm -hmm. Then you have these parents who have to live with the fact their child was taken needlessly on the day that was transitioning to a new year. So every time there's a new year, they have to live with that hurt. That is traumatic. So we need to stop being selfish. We need to consider the other. We have to have tolerance. Just as humility and gentleness form a firm footing in our worthy walk, patience and tolerance work together. Patience helps us to endure all kinds of circumstances. Tolerance helps us endure all kinds of people. You know it's hard dealing with the other. I always tell people, I'm my own worst enemy. If I'm gonna say somebody's a knucklehead, the line starts behind me. I'm the first one. So I can't call someone a knucklehead unless I acknowledge that I'm a knucklehead first. So we have to understand that Patience comes with trials, but tolerance comes with enduring all kinds of people. So I can endure people, because I understand I'm not easy to deal with in the first place. I can understand that. I could be a little bit rigid. I could be a little bit militant. I know I can be, mm -hmm. um, but that's my personality. Now I'm not saying this is who I am, just accept me. I'm just saying that I'm a work in progress and the Lord's still working in me. So that's what we have to keep in mind. And if the Lord's still working in me, that means the Lord's still working in you. So we have to build that tolerance to be able to work together and learn to endure all kinds of people. Tolerant people reach out with forgiveness, understanding, and sympathy. They treat each other with grace. That's another thing I have to learn, and I learned that from Pastor Sam. He was definitely more grace. Because when we first got together, I told them, I said, there were certain things that I just did not agree with. And I, I was like, I'm not, I'm not tolerating that. And he'd be like, give him another chance. Give him another chance. Give him another chance. And I'm the kind of person that's like, three strikes, you're out. And he would laugh about that. I'm like, no, three strikes, you're out. Then you're on the list. You don't want to be on that list. It's a short list, but you don't want to be on it. And he'd be like, no, no, you got to be more grace, more mercy, you gotta forgive people. So now I try to be more graceful, more forgiving. And that helps us in our walk. It helps us dealing with the other. Understanding that none of us are perfect. So we have to grow like Christ in different ways in different places. How many of you, when you shop for clothes, you notice that clothes doesn't always fit you the same way it fits someone else? For the ladies, you might be more hippie than another lady. For the man, your shoulders might be more broad than another man. So when you put on that sweater, it might look different. Like if you like some, a sweater on a person and you put it on, you're like, it just doesn't fit right. Because it was made for a cookie cutter cut. When clothes are made, they're not made for a specific person. They're made cookie cutter for everyone. It just not, may not fit everyone the same way. Now, we, if we understood that, then we understand to have tolerance for others because we weren't all cut from the same cookie cutter. Why? Because I've said it to the, to the world. We are all different people because we were formed differently in the sense of in the womb, God knew who we are. He knew how we were gonna come out. He knew how the environment may shape us, may. Because some people, psychologists believe the environment shapes the person. That's not necessarily true. I come from a rough neighborhood. Majority of people ended up selling drugs and going to jail and dying. 
I ended up going to law enforcement. I'm called a, reality, a rarity in my neighborhood. I go to my neighborhood, some people still think I'm a drug dealer and then others just look at me, they can't tell the difference. They don't know if I'm a drug dealer or law enforcement. They just look at me like, should I sell to this person or should I run away from this person? So, you know, what we have to understand is that none of us were made the same. We were meant to look the same in the sense of look like Christ. But what we ended up doing is diverting because of sin introduced in the world and our sinful nature. Because what we tend to do is that as we come to Christ and we bury our old self in, our, in the baptism of the waters, what we tend to do is sometimes we want to resurrect our old self. Have you ever done that? Resurrect your old self? When you get to the point that somebody gets on your nerves, you're gonna be like, okay. So I'm gonna resurrect um, the married that would just smack the person down. So we're gonna bring that married up and we're gonna put the, the, the godly woman back down, you know? It's like picking up a baton, you know? We're not gonna put that baton down. We need to pick up more of the word of God. That's what we have to keep in mind. That's what shapes us. But we tend to pick up the things that we should be letting go. So how many of you ever been hurt and the first thing your reaction is to go to those things that make you comfortable? Notice the things that make you comfortable are the things that are sinful. So it may be that drink. It may be that woman, it may be that man, sometimes it may be both. Those things should not be the first things you pick up when someone hurts you. You should not lean, lean on sinful things when you're hurt. You need to lean on Christ, because he's the healer. He's, as CJ, and I'm gonna school you now, Jehovah Jireh means our provider. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it means our provider, he provides for us. So therefore, we should be leaning on him. Because I may need money and go to Sister Mary and be like, Mary, let me $20, she's gonna look at me, I don't have it. I can't get upset at her, but I can pray to the Lord and the Lord can have someone who will bless me or open that door that for whatever I need that $20, that will be provided for. So that's who we lean on. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. 1 John chapter 4 verses 19 and 20 <clears throat> and we're going to go to verse 19 we love because he loved us first whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar I'm going to repeat that again. Sometimes we need to hear that more. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they've seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. When we look at the word love, we, before we served the Lord, had a misunderstanding of the word love. We could love hamburgers. But hamburgers can't love us back. Because that hamburger is just going to go in your gut. And sometimes it may hate you. And that way you may get a gut reaction. It may just hit you the wrong way. So love has to be a relationship. We see the love, the final stepping stone on the path to unity, is agape, unconditional love, that expects nothing in return. In many ways, the four virtues describe what real love looks like, which is what Paul says, humility, gentleness, patience, and tolerance. In love, love looks out not for one's own interest, but for the interest of others. All of these stepping stones together point to the way to true unity. It all starts with love. If we look at what Jesus did on the cross, he did that out of love. No one does that just to do that. It has to come out of love. So the same way you self-sacrifice, meaning that if someone hurts you, but yet you still tolerate being around them, that's a self-sacrifice. Because yes, in the flesh, they might have hurt you. They might have hurt your feelings and whatnot. But in the spirit, you're still being gracious to them. And you're lifting them up in prayer. And you're still treating them with love. Remember, there's a phrase, killing them with kindness. We need to be doing that more. You don't know how sometimes if a person doesn't love the Lord and the Lord is, is, they refuse to hear the Lord. When you 
love a person and you're killing them with kindness, how that aggravates them. Like for example, for those who don't know, I've been hurt from pastors in the past. And all I do is, whenever I see that pastor, I tell him, God bless you. I give him a hug. In the very beginning, he couldn't look at me in the eye. He'll be like, I'll be like, that's between you and God. I got no problems with you. Whatever problems you have with, you have to deal with him. Because as far as I'm concerned, you have no problem with me. So we have to treat people with love. We can only tolerate people with love. You know, have you ever had that person that like just dances on your last nerve? And you're like, I can't stand this person. As soon as you see them walk in, stop that. <laughs> as soon as you see them walk in, they're like, you're like, oh man, this person walked into this room. You know? Same thing can happen in church. You know? We should be thankful if a person we can't stand walks into church. Because that means God is still dealing with them. There's still that grace and mercy. There's still hope that person will change. So we should be thankful and lifting up prayers that they let God change them. Because really, it's us that we fight with God. And here's the funny thing. Our arms are too short to be fighting with God. I'm sorry, you're punching away above your weight class. You can't do it. It's a losing battle. And we have to come to that realization. We have to understand that we are one body. And we see that in verses 4 through 6 of Ephesians, of chapter 4. Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, rich and poor, young and old, all these conflicting types of people have been placed in one body, the church. There was never meant to be the old people's church. There was never meant to be the young people's church. There was never meant to be a black church. And there was never meant to be a white church. There should be diversity in the church, people from all nations. You shouldn't be identified as we're a black church. I've heard ministers say that. Oh, we're a black church located on the Lower East Side. That should not be a phrase coming out your mouth. Because you're already setting laws up, boundaries. We're only accepting black people. No one else allowed. No, that should not be the case because the body of Christ has no stipulation except and you love Jesus Christ, and you submit to him, and recognize him as your Lord and Savior. That's the only stipulation. It doesn't matter if you're Puerto Rican, Jamaican, does not matter that you recognize who Jesus is, that he died for your sins. So we are one spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us all a new life. There are not different Holy Spirits for different people. We share a common origin in the Holy Spirit work. The Spirit is the one who creates unity and empowers us to maintain it. So we should be looking to the Holy Spirit to guide us in our decisions. We are one hope. We share a common hope in Christ. And that hope is that he returns. That should be the desire of the church. That Jesus Christ returns. Not tomorrow, not yesterday. That he returns right now. We have the habit that we want to give a time frame to Christ because we want to do what we want to do. Jesus, don't return tomorrow because tomorrow I'm playing bingo. <laughs> Jesus, don't return tomorrow because I have that trip to Vegas and remember, I'm going to hit the casino so I don't want you to catch me and I'll be left behind. <laughs> Jesus, don't catch me tomorrow because, you know, I might make that mistake and um, visit the side trip and I know I shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be putting stipulations. If you're worried about getting caught off guard, then that means you should be worried enough not to do those things. That's what we have to keep in mind. We should be living godly, the goal of living godly on a daily basis. And it starts being immersed in the word of God. We know that we're reading the word of God together. We have been studying the word together. Last Wednesday, we uh, met through Zoom together and focused on the notes that we spoke on prior of what we learned so far. We even spoke about the transfiguration, how God's glory was revealed at that moment to those disciples and it was with a purpose okay we have to understand we have one lord paul already mentioned that all believers share in one spirit the third person of the trinity paul then refers to the second person of the trinity 
the one Lord, Jesus Christ. All true Christians have been saved by grace through faith in the person and the work of the one Lord, Jesus Christ. We have one faith. All Christians are united by one faith. In this instance, the word faith means the body of essential Christian truths. That means any person who's in another denomination, as long as they believe in the basic tenets of faith, Jesus Christ was incarnate, born in the flesh. He died for all our sins. He was crucified on the cross. He was resurrected three days later. And now he sits at the right hand of God the Father. We're Christians. You're my brother. You're my sister in Christ. Now, if some of the things they teach in your church are a little off, they're a little off. I'll keep you in prayer that they start teaching you better. But I could do my part and show you what the Lord has revealed to me and share through the word of God. That's why we walk through the verses together. If you notice, not every preaching, if you hear a preaching, do they go through the verses together. I remember hearing a, a, a teaching in Spanish. There was a sister, and mind you, she's been in the Lord longer than me, and she texted me one day, she goes, I heard this teaching, but I want you to review it and tell me, was it sound theology? And as soon as I started, the first thing I heard was that a guy quote the scripture, but he paraphrased it and didn't give the scripture. That's a problem. Because if you want people to be in scripture, you should be saying, okay, you can find this in Matthew. Go with me here and follow it. Does it not say this? And this is the proof text. That's what I do here. This is called expository preaching. Um, that same sister laughs because she goes, you're always teaching. I can't stop that. That's just my habit. And I praise the Lord that I can do that. So we see here, that we have to have a mindset of always learning. We have one Lord, one faith. We have one baptism. We share a common experience of being spiritually baptized into Christ. We have one God and Father as his adopted children. We share the same Father. You know, sadly, there's a lot of people out there who don't have fathers. In the sense, fathers involved. Because everybody has a father. It takes two people to make a child. And nowadays, people want to change terms and be like, um, I have two mothers, I have two dads. <coughs> Sorry, that was my intention. <laughs> the truth is the truth. All I'm saying is you wouldn't have said it if it wasn't true. Amen, amen. The truth hurts. <laughs> but one of the things that we learned Join the group, and I'm going to close with this, is if you go to Matthew chapter 5, <coughs> and excuse me because my voice is breaking up now, um, we went over what's called the Beatitudes, or what I like to call, let this be your attitude. So we went over the Beatitudes, and this goes well with the, the sermon, because as we see in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, and this is the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm reading it in the New International Version. Verse 1 says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who persecute because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Excuse me. <coughs> Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil. <coughs> Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who, are, who were before you. Amen. Thank you. We all need a little help once in a while. <laughs> so no it's okay thank you so just to finish off what we see in these verses relates how many of you know what tomorrow is Martin Luther King 
Oh. Martin Luther King <laughs> emphasized this. If you look at that time period, a lot of people judge Martin Luther King because they say he stepped out on his wife. <coughs> he was not a perfect man. But none of us are perfect. People didn't believe in his theory of nonviolence. We have to understand that he came understanding the theory of nonviolence through the Beatitudes. The meek should inherit the earth. To the people in Alabama, they were saying, how these people are not worth it because they're weak, because they were looking meek. Let me tell you something. I saw an episode of, again, I'm gonna bring it up. Doesn't mean you should watch it. <laughs> the Boondocks. It's a cartoon which used to be a newspaper article. And they had an episode of Martin Luther King. And they were flashing back into the time of um, when they were walking across the bridge. And they were showing people protesting. And you see all these people getting beat down, right? And one brother who was getting beat down was a big dude. He looked like John Henry, literally looked like John Henry, right? So people are hitting him, and then some, one of the brothers didn't want to be part of that because he said, I get beat down already as is. Why am I going to go down there and get beat down too? You know, that was his mindset, not understanding what purpose it would serve. He didn't have a kingdom vision, and this is what Martin Luther King had, a kingdom vision of to show people in society that was recorded on film at that time so people all around the world can see, they were not fighting. They came in peace, but they were treated like they were in invasion. So they were beat down like invaders, but they were there. They were already there. We have our place. We shouldn't be treated as invaders. We all have our place on this earth. God made us to be on this earth. And we were made to be good stewards. And it starts with the other, meaning loving one another, being respectful for one another. And people at that time were not being respectful to one another. So what Martin Luther King was showing is that even in meekness, we were mighty. We were mighty because we have God on our side. You know, so many people today react with strength, not realizing that in weakness, we are far stronger. Not everything should be a knee reaction to violence. One of the things I always have a talk with people about politics, which I don't like politics. I don't like politicians. I'm going to be real with you. One thing I always say is, a person who serves as president of the United States should be someone who served in the military. First of all, because if you didn't serve in the military, how can you understand the value of a lost life? Anyone who's been a soldier who has to carry a friend of theirs, a fellow buddy, who has died, you're less chance to cause more violence. So to have someone who wants to hold the highest office in the nation and not understand, oh, we'll just nuke them all. No, you have to understand what the value of that is. You should be desiring peace, not violence. You can't think like the president of um, North Korea, which is nuclear war. Self-destruction. <coughs> That's not the mindset to have. So I close with this, because I can't go anymore. <laughs> we have to walk in our newness. <coughs> we have to learn to be meek, more loving. And we have to be immersed in the word of God. And that's the only way it will be possible for us to be walking in unity. We have to be immersed in the word of God. And I'm going to have my wife come up here. She's going to close us out in prayer. If anybody wants prayer, just stand up, please. And I'm going to have, um, if nobody wants prayer, we all can use prayer. Amen. So come on up. And I'm going to use a powerful young man of God. He's going to pray over. I'll pray along with him, but he's going to pray over you. Anybody else who wants to come up for prayer can feel free to come up.